The term Israel of God in Scripture in Galatians 6.16 clearly refers to the international true church. It's not a reference to natural, national Israel, what we would call the Jew today. It's important to make that distinction clear. It's obvious in Paul's writings in Philippians 3.3 3, that we Christians, the international church of God, without regard to our blood ancestry, it's obvious that we are the spiritual circumcision. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul speaks of Israel according to the flesh. That's lost in modern translations, but it's there in the King James. Israel according to the flesh is clearly national, natural, unconverted Israel. The Jews for whom Paul hopes for a national conversion in the future. The mistake made by Zionism is that unconverted Jews, national, natural Israel now, are not achieving their destiny until they accept the Messiah. And they have refused the Messiah so far. So it's quite wrong to support Israel politically, come what may, as though being a Jew, they need to be supported. Paul was not in favor of that at all. The 1948 episode was certainly significant in that the promises for what is now national, natural Israel can now come to pass in a way that was not possible before Israel had a statehood. That's quite clear. But they returned in unbelief in 1948. The Bible is interested in them returning finally in belief, coming to belief in Messiah when they say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's at the second coming and not before. The parousia, the second coming, the arrival of Jesus in glory, a single event, by the way, not certainly a double event with a pre-tribulation rapture, rather a rapture catching up to meet the Lord as he comes down to escort the royal visitor on his way to the earth. That's a single event at the parousia, the single soul arrival of Jesus in power and glory. That's perfectly plain from Second Thessalonians chapter 1, where Paul says that the Christians are now being afflicted, and that affliction will be justified, will be, and that affliction will be rectified and come to an end, and they will receive anesis or relief in 2 Thessalonians 1, only when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance on his enemies. That's not a pre-tribulation rapture. That had not entered Paul's head. He knows of one single event, the resurrection and catching up to meet the Lord in the air, as Jesus, of course, recognized the same single event in the Olivet Discourse. Now, Paul is very interested, as was Jesus, in the main single sign of the second coming, of that one arrival of Jesus in glory. And Jesus said that precisely in Matthew 24. He said, when this gospel of the kingdom, and that's the gospel that is so rather obviously missing from evangelicalism, the phrase gospel of the kingdom is seldom heard. When the gospel of the kingdom, that is the saving gospel, as preached always by Jesus and Paul, when that saving gospel of the kingdom has finally been preached worldwide, hard for any of us to know the extent to which that has to happen, how far it's already happened, how much yet needs to be done is unknown. But when that has been accomplished, then Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, the end will come when you therefore see the abomination of desolation. The logical connection there is absolutely clear. The end will not come until the gospel has been preached worldwide, and that end will be marked by an extraordinary event, the appearance of the abomination of desolation in Mark 13, 14. He's a person standing where he ought not to. In Matthew, clearly a temple reference, holy place. All of this is taken up then by Jesus in Luke chapter 21, equally where the equivalent of that abomination of desolation is the surrounding of Jerusalem by armies. We must say quite dogmatically and clearly, I think, this is not a reference to 70 AD, except as precursive, it was a kind of foreshadowing. But Jesus is talking about the end of the age. That was the question asked of him in Matthew 24. And all three Gospels give a plain sequence of events that cannot be divided between two periods of time, i.e. AD 70 and the still future. No, they're talking about the end of the age. That's the question. And the parousia, the arrival of Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 3. Now that end of the age will only come after the appearance of the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to in a holy place. All of this, of course, goes back to Daniel. 
as Jesus explicitly said, he said to the reader there, or whoever uh, edited that passage, by no means must you misunderstand the reference to Daniel. People blithely make up their own definition of the abomination of desolation as an event in 70 AD. That's impossible. The reason for that would be that in Daniel 9, verse 26, the second half there, that evil prince who comes and interferes with the city and the sanctuary, that evil person, the Antichrist, comes to his end. He comes to the end of his life in that event. This is not true of Titus in 70 AD. The his end is very significant. Correct translation there. Kizzo references to the end of the life, the demise of that evil final anti-Christian person. That same his end is found in Daniel 11.45. And in chapter 8, much neglected, chapter 8 is highly significant because it's a prophecy of the end time, not of BC times. You see, the tendency of prophecy studies has been to put the future behind us if we don't like it. The preterizing of prophecy is the blight upon prophecy studies. Chapter 8 of Daniel speaks of the end time as being the subject of that prophecy. That's in chapter 8, verses 17 and 19. Likewise, the evil horn there, clearly the same as the horn in chapter 7, comes to his end. He's destroyed without human hand, supernaturally destroyed. That event takes place close to the resurrection of the dead in chapter 11, leading into chapter 12, a great tribulation, Jesus referring there in Matthew 24, 21, back to Daniel 12, 1, which is in connection with the demise of the evil one who comes to his end. All of this is future. And so it's reasonable for Christians to look forward to the rebuilding of some sort of sanctuary. This could happen when the Antichrist is allowing Jews to build a temple. That might be the reason they would accept him at least for the beginning of that seven-year period, that final heptad of Daniel 9. The Antichrist and the Jews get together. He allows them to build a temple, which they'd really love to do, because not having believed in Jesus and the forgiveness of sin in his blood, they have no other forgiveness but the ritual ceremony prescribed by the temple. So the Antichrist and Jesus... So the Antichrist and national, natural Israel, as it now is, get together and they confirm a covenant between each other. Halfway through that seven years, everything goes wrong. The Antichrist turns out to the beast, and for that final 42 months, 1260 days, based on Daniel 9, a key, key passage, there will be a time of unparalleled tribulation. All of this is future. To tear it in half and try to apply part of it to AD 70, part of the future, really makes a chaos of all of this very important material, because for Jesus... The Sermon on the Mount is not less or more important than the Olivet Discourse. Paul in, first, in 2 Thessalonians 1.5 said that he used to speak to the Thessalonians in the very short time that he was founding the church. He spoke to